Tonight, I have the opportunity of sharing with you how astronomy and physics brought me to faith in Jesus Christ eight years before I got to know a Christian. And uh, if you go to our book table, you'll see cards that are similar to this. And uh, if you fill that out, we're actually going to give you a free DVD where I share in much more detail than I have tonight uh, how uh, physics and astronomy brought me to faith in Jesus Christ. It also features me fielding questions from skeptics. So that's a free gift for you uh, this evening. But uh, my story is that I was raised in Canada. I grew up in British Columbia, a really beautiful place. Uh, but Christians are hard to find in Canada. I didn't really get to know a Christian, at least to get to know a Christian well, until I was 27 years of age. And that's happened when I arrived on the Caltech campus. Caltech is loaded uh, with believers. So that's really where I had my first exposure uh, to Christians. However, I did get to meet some stars and galaxies when I was seven years of age. And that happened because I was walking with my parents in the evening and said, Mom, Dad, are those stars hot? They said, yes, the stars are hot. I said, please, tell me why they're hot. And they said, you've got to go to the library, which is exactly what I did. And I came home with five books on physics and astronomy, and I did that every week. Every week I would go to the public library and bring home these books. And ever since I was seven years of age, I have been deeply fascinated by the universe of galaxies, stars, and the planets. And by the time I was eight years of age, I knew that my future career would lie in astrophysics. And uh, that's what led me to make some unexpected discoveries, because what happened from the age of eight onwards is I would pick a, a particular sub-discipline of astronomy and give that an in-depth study. So one year I looked at stellar interiors, another year at the atmospheres of stars and the structure of galaxies. And as when I was 16, I devoted a year to studying cosmology. Now that's not the same as cosmetology. There really is a difference. <laughs> cosmology is the science of the origin and history of the universe. And that was a time when there was a lot of debate going on. Is it a steady state universe? Uh, is it an oscillating universe? Is it a Big Bang universe? And there were two or three other theories. But at that time, the evidence was heavily favoring that it was indeed a Big Bang universe. And if it's Big Bang, that means there's a beginning. And if there's a beginning, there must be a beginner. And so starting in age 17, I went on a quest to find the beginner of the universe. And I first looked for that beginner in the writings of Immanuel Kant, because he's the father of modern cosmology, and he writes about God. But what he wrote in his Critique of Pure Reason is that space and time have existed for eternity. And I knew that was incorrect. Space and time didn't exist until the universe came into existence. And he had other ideas that were not fitting what I knew to be true about astronomy. I went to Descartes, I went to a few other philosophers, and finally, I gave up on uh, these philosophers and began to look at the holy books of the religions of the world. And I began with Hinduism and the Hindu Vedas. But I discovered in Hinduism, they teach that we live in a reincarnating universe, a universe that goes through endless cycles of rebirths, where the universe is born, it dies, it's reborn, it dies again, but with a cycle of 4.32 billion years. And I knew that number was not correct. I also knew that the universe had an entropy measure that was 100 million times too high uh, to permit the possibility of a rebirth of the universe. And so I put Hinduism aside. Now, the high school I went to in Vancouver uh, was predominantly Asian. We had a lot of Buddhists. And so they encouraged me to look at the Buddhist commentaries. I discovered that Buddhism teaches the same cosmology as Hinduism. And we had a couple of students in our high school that were Muslims. I looked at the Quran, and I noted that the creation texts in the Quran contradicted one another. One of them implied that the planets were more distant than the stars. And even with a naked eye, we know that that is incorrect. Uh, there was a gentleman in our school who was of the Baha'i faith, and he says, 
he was looking at my studies, and he says, what we do in Baha'i is we take the kernels of truths from all the different religions, and we put them together into a consistent package. I says, great, show me what you got. A week later, I went back to him and said, well, from what I can tell what's happened in Baha'i, they take all the errors of the world's religions and put them together into an inconsistent package. And he said, well, show me what you've got. And he wound up leaving the Baha'i faith. Now, when I told you earlier that I didn't get to know Christians until I was 27 years of age, I actually did see some from a distance uh, when I was growing up. So, for example, when I was 11 years of age, uh, there were two men that came into our public school and put two boxes on our teacher's desk and left without saying a single word. But in those boxes were Gideon Bibles, and we're all invited to take one, and every one of us did. My Gideon Bible stayed on my shelf, untouched, unread, for six years. And in hindsight, I'm glad I didn't pick it up right away because the Gideons gave me a foreign language edition that we call the King James Translation. <laughs> but the benefit of a high school education in Canada is starting in grade seven, we would go through two of William Shakespeare's plays every year. So by the time I was 17, I was fluent in King James English. <laughs> and so I picked up this Gideon Bible. And uh, what I notice in going through that Gideon Bible is it repeatedly said something I didn't see in any other holy book. Everything must be tested. Don't believe until you first put it to the test. But if it passes the test, accept it. As Paul says in Thessalonians, everything is to be tested, but hold fast to that which proves to be true. And I found this repeated throughout the Bible. I didn't see this in any other holy book. But the other thing I notice about the Bible is that it perfectly followed the scientific method. Now, I hear it's different here in America, but in Canada, we're taught the scientific method in grade one. We're taught it in grade two. We're taught it in grade three. We get it every single year. But none of my public school teachers told me where the scientific method came from. When I picked up my Gideon Bible, every time the Bible spoke about creation, the scientific method leapt off the page. And what I realized is the Bible not only commands objective testing, it tells us step by step how everything is to be put to the test. And what I discovered was it was no accident that the scientific revolution exploded out of Reformation Europe. During the Reformation, people were encouraged to read the Bible for themselves. And those with a scientific bent saw this biblical testing method, they applied it to their science, and that was the birth of the scientific method, and that's what launched the scientific revolution. And I recognize, too, at uh, age 17 and 18, science was stillborn in every other culture. It's only in the Christian milieu that it had a chance to be born and to flourish and to continue to explode uh, to this very day. Now, what I'm going to show you in the next few minutes is how this biblical testing method helps us to see that Genesis 1, the very first page of the Bible, is not a scientific embarrassment. If you follow that biblical testing method, everything it states is correct with respect to modern science, and it's all in the correct chronological sequence. I'm going to share that story because that's what motivated me to begin to make a more serious study of the Bible. It literally took me four and a half hours to get out of the first page of the Bible because I was checking everything out. But at the end of that, I realized this book is different. This is the only book I picked up where it got the creation story accurate in every detail. Now, let me just quickly take you through it and then I'll tell you what happened later on as I came to that conclusion. <clears throat> First of all, the opening sentence of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And as I was sharing with the men this morning, when I saw that, I said, what are these heavens and earth? And I went through the whole of the Old Testament looking for the word universe. It's not there. What I now understand, in biblical Hebrew, there is no word for universe. 
There is in Greek, but not in Hebrew. Instead, they have this phrase, the Shamayan Ares, the heavens and the earth. So whenever you see the heavens and the earth with a definite article in the Old Testament, you'll see it nine times every time it refers to the totality of physical reality. Not just all matter and energy, but all space and time. And when I got to the New Testament, I actually saw there are places where it says that God was doing things before he created the universe, before he created space and time. In fact, what's interesting is how God begins his works of redeeming humanity to himself before he creates anything. 2 Timothy 1.9, the grace of God that we now experience was put into effect before the beginning of time. Or Titus 1.2, the hope that we share in Jesus Christ was given to us before the beginning of time. And that's what's unique about the Bible. The non-biblical books of the religions of the world teach that space and time are eternal and that God or gods or cosmic forces create within this eternity of space and time. But the Bible stands alone in saying space and time don't exist until God creates the universe. Now, I was just beginning to uh, enter into a physics program at the University of British Columbia when I saw all this in the Bible. That was the same time that physicists in Britain were developing the first of the space-time theorems. And it was those theorems that launched Stephen Hawking to worldwide fame. He was one of the two authors on the first of those space-time theorems. In fact, I'm going to show you that theorem right now. I actually got the paper. If you love tensor calculus, I, you can actually peruse that. Uh, but for those of you who are not into tensor calculus, this is the bottom line of the space-time theorem. It basically says space and time are created if two conditions are true. Condition number one, the universe contains mass. Each one of you is living proof that the universe contains mass. I won't point my finger, but some of you are a little more so than others. Okay. Condition number two, the equations of general relativity reliably describe the movements of bodies in the universe. Now, when I was 17, that was only proven to 1% precision. Today, it's proven to 15 places of the decimal. Today, general relativity ranks as the most exhaustively tested and best proven principle in all of physics. There's nothing we're more certain of in physics than the reliability of general relativity. But what this theorem is saying, if general relativity is reliable and if the universe contains mass, then space and t time must have a beginning. Space and time must be created which implies there must be a being beyond space and time that created our universe of matter, energy, space, and time. So here I was 17 years of age realizing that it's the God of the Bible that has now been proven by physics to be responsible for the universe. Just looking at Genesis 1.1, we can establish it's not the God of Hinduism or Buddhism or Islam or Baha'i, it's the God of the Bible that created the universe. See how rich the opening sentence of the Bible is? Okay, 